How do we know that the biblical documents we have today are accurate and reliable? How do we know that they haven't been corrupted over time and contain little more than fiction? Like our cold case investigations, we need certainty in two important areas of investigation. First, we need to make sure that we know what the gospel said in the first place. And second, we need to know if there is good reason to believe that these documents were well-preserved over time. In order to find out if a case for the accuracy of the Gospels can be made, we're going to investigate what the Gospel writers first said and then study the way that these statements were preserved over time. If we examine what these first eyewitnesses said to their students, then we can reasonably trace the content of the Gospels from their alleged date of creation to the earliest existing copies. The Apostle John, living from about 86 to 100, was the youngest of Jesus' disciples, and he taught two students, importantly, and passed the gospel into their trusted hands. John taught Ignatius, who lived from AD 35 to 117. He was a student of John, eventually became bishop at Antioch, Turkey. Following the apostle Peter, seven authentic letters from Ignatius survive to this day. It's important to remember that it was not his desire to retell the gospel. His writings presume that these gospels were readily available to his readers. It was Ignatius' goal to encourage and admonish local church groups. Along the way, he did refer to the New Testament documents and nature of Jesus. In Ignatius' letters, I found the following portrayal of Jesus. One, the prophets predicted and waited for Jesus. Two, Jesus was in the line of King David. Three, he was and is the Son of God. Four, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Five, a star announced his birth. Six, he came forth from God the Father. Seven, he was born of the Virgin Mary. Eight, he was baptized by John the Baptist. Nine, he was the perfect man. Ten, he manifested the will and knowledge of God the Father. Eleven, he taught and had a ministry on earth. Twelve, he was the source of wisdom and knowledge of God the Father. Thirteen, he taught and had a ministry on earth. Fourteen, he spoke the words of God. Fifteen, he was unjustly treated and condemned by men. He suffered and was crucified. He died on the cross. He sacrificed himself for us as an offering to God the Father. This all take place under the government of Pontius Pilate. Herod the Tetrarch was king. Jesus was resurrected. He had a physical body, is Lord, is God. He is our Savior in the way to true life. His sacrifice glorified us. Faith in Christ's work on the cross saves us. The salvation and forgiveness are gifts of grace from God. Jesus loves the church. We as the church celebrate the Lord's Supper in Jesus' honor. The letters of Ignatius demonstrate that the New Testament's claims and writings existed early in history. Ignatius appears to be very familiar with many passages from the Gospel and the letters of Paul. In addition, he echoes John's description of Jesus. Fact two, Paul's students confirm the accuracy of the Gospel. Clement was a co-worker of Paul, mentioned specifically in Philippians 4.3. And he became an important assistant to Paul and Peter in the first years of Rome. In fact, Peter appears to have elevated Linus and Clement to positions of leadership so that he could focus in on prayer and preaching. Clement wrote several letters, and one of those letters, the first epistle of Clement to the Corinthians, survives as the earliest Christian document outside of the New Testament. Clement's letters was written to encourage the Corinthian church and call it to holy living. Clement's description of Jesus was very similar to that offered by Ignatius. I won't number these out just because that's exhausting, but 17 facts here. The prophets predicted the life and ministry of Jesus. Jesus provided his disciples with important instruction. He taught principles as described by Mark and Luke. He was humble and assume, unassuming. 
He was whipped. He suffered and died for our salvation. He died as a payment for our sin. He was resurrected from the dead. He is alive and reigning with God. His resurrection makes our resurrection certain. We are saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus. He is Lord and Son of God. He possesses eternal glory and majesty. All creation belongs to him. He is our refuge and our high priest. He is our defender and helper. The church belongs to him. Fact three. Peter's students confirmed the accuracy of the gospel. The apostle Peter was likely the oldest of Jesus' disciples. Uh, John Mark was the cousin of Barnabas, and his childhood home was well known to Peter. Mark became so close to Peter that the apostle described him as my son. Peter preserves his eyewitness testimony through his primary disciple and student, who then passes it on to the next generation in what we now recognize as the gospel of Mark. Mark established a church in Alexandria, taught Ananias, Avilius, Cajun, Primus, and Justice, passing on his gospel along with other early New Testament accounts from apostolic witnesses. These five men eventually became bishops of Alexandria following Mark's death. They faithfully preserved the eyewitness accounts, passed them from one generation to another. These excerpts are from Cold Case Christianity by a former atheist and now Christian apologist J. Warner Wallace. A much more complete chain of custody is represented in the book. There's also a, a free course uh, he has online where similar topics are addressed. Of course, uh, there's a J. Warner Wallace YouTube channel, a lot of good resources online. Now, if you don't know his backstory, he set out to prove Christianity wrong, and upon examining the evidence and reviewing eyewitness testimonies, he could no longer hold that faith-based view that those eyewitness testimonies represented in the New Testament and further corroborated through extensive historical documents and letters, um, he couldn't view that as fables any longer. Um, however, as the founder of Harvard Law, Simone Greenleaf wrote in Testimony of the Evangelist, Christianity, says Bishop Wilson, inscribes on the portal of her dominion. Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. Christianity does not profess to convince the perverse and headstrong to bring irresistible evidence to the daring and profane to vanquish the proud scorner and afford evidences from which the careless and perverse cannot possibly escape. This might go to destroy man's responsibility. All that Christianity professes is to propose such evidences as may satisfy the meek, tractable, candid, serious inquirer. 